Quite a bit of the time recently has been devoted to a few days towards the end of that earthly ministry. He entered Jerusalem for the Holy Day holiday of unleavened bread and Passover. And something significant is happening, and I'm going to to bring back to remembrance, not that you don't know the story of Passover, but it's one of those things that as we recall what the great and awesome things and wonders that our Lord has done, that it causes us to rejoice and be strengthened in our faith. And so there was a family of 12 brothers who went to Egypt because there was a famine. And they stayed there because Joseph, one of the brothers, had significant authority in Egypt. And they were welcomed with open arms. And as they were in Egypt, this family grew and grew so much so that they became a small nation. And they became large enough that the Pharaoh, the leader, was concerned. So he ordered that the male babies would be murdered on their birth. But the midwives feared God and not Pharaoh and, and gave excuses saying that the, that the Hebrew women were so strong that they would give birth even before they got there. But there came a time when the Pharaohs no longer remembered Joseph and made the Hebrews slaves. And they worked them and made their lives miserable. And then God called a man in the wilderness of Midian who had been there tending sheep for 40 years, who was raised in the household of Pharaoh, who he himself tried to deliver his people on their own and then ran in fear. And God called him and sent him to Pharaoh to let his people go. And this was some 400 years after the family arrived, just as God had told Abraham, the progenitor of that family. And he sent Moses, and God performed 10 wonders and signs Everything from turning water into blood to plagues of locusts and darkness and gnats and cattle diseases and all these various things. But there was one final plague that God was going to deliver. And he told his people to take an, a lamb and sacrifice it and place the blood on the doorposts, the lintel, and on the sides. And he says, if the death angel saw the blood, it would pass over. It would not inspect the quality of the lives of the people inside the house. Seeing the blood, it would pass over. And those who did not do such would lose the firstborn in that household. And prior to that, what they were to do is after they sacrificed the lamb and placed the blood on the door posts, that they were to take and roast the lamb and take unleavened bread, the bread of haste, and to have a meal in haste. And they were to do so, as I said, with their feet shod and and their loins girded so that they were ready for travel. Because the next day, Deliverance would come and they would no longer be slaves, would be free. And that took place. And God led those people out of Egypt with a cloud at in day and a pillar of fire at night as he would lead them. And then they came to the sea where the f- army of Pharaoh was behind them. And God parted the sea and they walked across the Red Sea not the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea on dry land. And then the sea enveloped 
Pharaoh's army, and they had nothing to fear. And after they were there, God told them that they were to celebrate this Passover and this unleavened bread every year, perpetually. It was something that they were to do in remembrance of God's deliverance from their slavery. They weren't to do so necessarily in joy. And if you've ever been to a Passover Seder, you know when the plagues are recounted, it is not recounted with a sense of joy at the destruction of the Egyptians. It's a sense of of, um, despair. But they were to celebrate this Passover. And the law said that every male, if at all able, was to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus and his disciples were going to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. Now this Passover is going to be exceptionally special. It's going to look back to God freeing his people. But at that point, in that Passover, it celebrated the freedom of the Hebrews. The Passover that is going to come in a day is going to celebrate the freedom of all mankind. All of our sins will be passed over because of the blood of the Lamb. Just as John the baptizer said as he saw Jesus Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Just as Abraham told Isaac, when God had told Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son on a mountain that he would show him. And I believe that that mountain would be what we would later call Calvary or Golgotha. And as they were going and Isaac had the wood for the burnt offering on his back, carrying it, symbolizing what would soon take place some many centuries later. Isaac asked a very simple question. Where's the lamb? And Abraham said to his son, God himself will provide the lamb. And when when Isaac was placed on the altar and Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son and Abraham was not waiting for God to stop him, the scriptures tell us that Abraham considered his son dead. But because Isaac was the son of the promise that he believed that God could even resurrect his son from the dead. So he's not willing to withhold anything from God. And so when God stopped Abraham, And they took the boy off the offering. There was a ram caught in the thicket. And they used the ram as a sacrifice. But that was not what Abraham was talking about. It was what John talked about. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the very thing that had been prophesied centuries before, that God himself would send his own son to act as our Passover lamb. The scriptures that I believe is in Corinthians tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And I think we need to understand that first Passover to understand the true meaning of our Passover. That it doesn't matter the quality of your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. All that matters is that God sees the blood of his lamb and passes over our sins. It's something that we should be mindful of. It is something that we should celebrate. And it's something that we should tell others. And so now we're going to come to this Passover and his 
disciples are going to celebrate with him, and they're going to think that it's a Passover like all other Passovers, where we recall the past. But the one distinction in the Jewish observance of Passover is that they don't talk about it as if it happened many centuries ago. They talk about it as if if they were the ones who were free. Because they were and are. And the sacrifice that Jesus will some do is not an event that took place so many centuries ago, but something that applies to our lives now that we have been made free from sin and death. But his disciples didn't know that. They were going to celebrate the past as present. And Jesus is going to celebrate the past, the present, and the future. But during this time, For all these plans, for you see, the households were preparing for the Passover. And part of the preparation of the Passover was to make sure that there was no leaven in the homes. And so the homes would be cleaned and they would make sure that all leaven was was gone. And even today, there is a a little ceremony where uh, the people will clean their houses. And then so that the father might look like, you know, he was... Um, substantially involved in it. They give him a little leaven and they, he throws it outside the house and says something and, and all of a sudden he's the big guy because he cast out the leaven. And as a matter of fact, there are laws that, for instance, if you own a cat, they tend to have you know, food and whatever. And so the law would require you to sell your cat. Now you try to you know buy it back and make these things, but they took these things seriously. This Passover, many people are treating as if it's the same as every other year. But there are a couple of groups who don't. And in Matthew chapter 26, we're going to look at Matthew and we're going to look at Luke back and forth. And in verse 3, it says this. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Here are these religious leaders who are taking a man who all will say is guilty of nothing other than to say that he is the son of God. Their plan is to kill him, but they were saying not during the festival, otherwise a riot might occur among the people. So they plan to seize him and to not just do away, but to kill him. And if we jump over to Luke chapter 22, it says this. And now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. And the chiefs and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. You see, they had planned action, and they conspired together to murder Jesus. But because of their fear of the people, and because Jerusalem was now occupied about three times its normal size because of all the people going to Jerusalem, to celebrate Passover, that they were afraid that the people would turn against them so that their plan was to wait until Passover was over. That was their plan. God had a different plan. You see, Jesus wasn't going to be sacrificed just on any old day. The plan of God from the foundation of the world was to tell us that he is the Passover lamb. And so the plans of evil men are to kill him, but later, God's plan is different. And so looking back again at Matthew chapter 26, it says this. So their plan was after the Passover. And it says this at verse 
14. Then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. From then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to portray Jesus. And then again, looking back at Luke, it says this. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So they consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. So there was a contract between one of the twelve that Jesus had chosen. To betray him for money. Now the sad thing is, is that Judas was the treasurer of the twelve. He could have gone with as much money as he wanted to. And if you will, if you think about it, if Jesus were to live a reasonably long life, he would have had a lot more opportunity to take more than 30 pieces of silver. And let's face it, 30 pieces of silver back then may have been a substantial amount of money, but not life changing. He was willing to betray his friend, his teacher, the one he had spent three plus years walking with for 30 pieces of silver. Not even enough to change his life permanently. But you see, God's in control. He even allows Satan to enter into Judas to contract, to make an agreement, to betray Jesus. Why? So that Jesus might be sacrificed on Passover. You see, now the, the chief priests, and the, they were no longer afraid of the crowd because now they were going to do away with him secretly, away from the crowd, and Judas presented them that opportunity. So now they speed it, speeded up their plan to get rid of him. So when you're struggling and you wonder, it just seems like nothing's working out. God is not only in control, he directs it. He takes evil men and speeds up their timeline. He takes a betrayer of not only a friend and a teacher, but the son of the living God. So that Jesus might accomplish what Jesus was sent to accomplish. When Jesus was sent to accomplish it. That is the God that we serve. And so all of this is happening when the Jerusalem is filled with all these people ready to celebrate Passover, ready to celebrate when they were going to acknowledge that they were free and they were done so in such a quick time that they would eat unleavened bread because it was a bread of haste because they were leaving Egypt right away. And they left Egypt not with simply the clothes on their back. And they took spoils from Egypt of silver and gold and beautiful things and jewelry. Not that they robbed from their masters, but that the masters freely gave them. And so in Matthew 26, verse 17, it says this. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? You see, this was just like every other day, as far as every other Passover. We need to do this. We need to be prepared. You know, we're here in Jerusalem. You know, we're not in Capernaum where it's our home. So we got to figure out where it is we can have it. And we got to prepare and got to make sure it's clean. 
And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples had directed them and they prepared the Passover. So that's interesting. Jesus says this, whatever. But I want you to see what Luke tells us because he gives us a little more information. Luke 22, 7 says this. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? It's like, we don't know. This is a big town. It's pretty crowded. And he said to them, when you have entered the city, that's Jerusalem, because they're staying in Bethany, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the great, the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And when they left, they found everything just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. This is how much in charge God is. He knows exactly when a man carrying a pitcher of water is going to be outside the house carrying a pitcher of water. And he knows that that man carrying a pitcher of water is going to enter a specific house at a specific time. And then you're to meet the owner of that house. And that house has a large guest room, large enough so that I can eat with the, my 12. So there's 13 of us who are going to eat the Passover Go there and prepare it. And guess what? God is in such control that as they go, they find a man carrying a pitcher of water. They find him entering the house. They go in and the owner says, here, prepare it here. So what's happened in your life that you can't trust the Lord? I mean, yeah, he heals people. Yeah, he raises the dead. Yeah, he cures the blind and the deaf and the lame. He even knows when people are carrying water. So when the word of God says that he knows you so well, that he knows every single hair on your head, he knows when you rise up and he knows when you lay down. Remember the guy carrying a pitcher of water. Because it seems like it's an inconsequential thing to carry a pitcher of water. Because it's probably something necessary. Because, you know, back then they didn't have running water. You had to go to the well and get it. But Jesus knows precisely the rising up and the setting down. You can trust him. So we see Jesus in control. He's in control of evil men. He's even in control of spiritual wickedness. And he's in control of everyday events. So that he might accomplish his purpose. And his purpose is to die for you and me. That he is our Passover lamb. I hear people say, well, you know, it's the Old Testament. It's old. We have the new one. It's improved. It's better. So let's just read it. And you don't see the richness of the New Testament. You don't see the richness of Passover. You don't see the richness of the fact of Passover being one that we just pass over the sins. 
We don't have to, yeah, but how can his blood cover my sins? You don't know what I've done. He does. And that's the point. I see his blood and pass over your sins. He doesn't say, I see the blood and I take a peek inside. Now, for those of you who are a little more aware, you know that there are seven holy days. There's unleavened bread, there's Passover, there's Pentecost. And then there are, there's the day of atonement and the the blowing of the shofar and there's the Shabbat, or I mean, um, the day of a booth. We are seeing that God, not only in the Old Testament, fulfilled unleavened bread and Passover. Down the road, we will see that he also fulfills first fruits and Pentecost. If God has fulfilled those Old Testament holy days, then maybe we should prepare and understand the other three. Because I find that God never does anything half He does it complete, he does it perfectly, and he does it well. So maybe we should take a look at Leviticus. Not the parts where, or numbers where it talks about so many people here and so many people there, but there's some great stuff in Leviticus. I I led a, a Bible study many years ago, and I changed the name from Leviticus to Worship Leviticus. Because it talks about worshiping God. So today, I want you to understand that God is not just in control. He's in charge. That God does all things well according to his timing, according to his will. And that he does so even in your life. And that when we sing or talk about the love of God and his grace, that we remember that grace is not about how sinful I am but how merciful and forgiving he is. And that's what Passover is all about. Now, in the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at that one evening. The Gospel of John has about, I would say about a third of the Gospel of John is devoted to that evening. There is great teaching there. There is great teaching in action there. And we're going to take a look at it. All of it happened. Passover. Celebration. So when we come in the future and do what is part of the Passover, what we call the Lord's Supper or communion, I want you to remember the richness of not just the bread and the drink, but the richness of what it truly means. That we were once in bondage, in slavery, but are now free from sin. We are now no longer dead, but alive in him. Because Jesus is our Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. He didn't die because events overtook him. He died because that was his ministry, his purpose, and he did so in all submission because he loved you and me and the Father that much. And all God's people said,